He is a product of public elementary and independent secondary school. Singleton earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his master's degree from the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. He began his career as an Ivy League admissions director, and in 1992, he founded the Pacific Educational Group, also called PEG, to support families in their transitions within and between K through 12 and higher education. His company rapidly grew into a vehicle for addressing systemic educational inequity by providing a framework, guidance, and support to K-12 systems and institutions of higher education focused on meeting the needs of underserved students of color. PEG designs and delivers individualized, comprehensive professional development for educators in the form of training, coaching, and consulting. Specifically, PEG helps educators focus on heightening their awareness of institutional racism and implementing effective strategies for eliminating racial achievement disparities in schools. In 1995, Singleton developed Beyond Diversity, and I'm sure he'll talk to you a little bit about that tonight, a widely recognized seminar, which is the foundation for the PEG seminar, Systemic Racial Equity Framework and the Theory of Transformation, which focuses on leadership development, teacher action research, and family community empowerment. Today, participants around the world use Singleton's Courageous Conversations um, agreements, his six conditions, and his compass. And as many of you know, we've used those in our principalship program at UT Austin. PEG, has, um, PEG also hosts an annual summit for Courageous Conversations in which scholars, educators, community members, and other stakeholders convene to identify strategies and best practices for creating high-level, equitable learning environments for all students. I first met Glenn at Summit in San Antonio, which I believe was 2012, right? And uh, it was at that time that I heard Glenn speak, and after I heard him speak, I just said, we have to get Glenn Singleton to UCA. So I went up and approached him and said, uh, Glenn, you know, you have to come to UCA. Um, he had mentioned that he was interested in making more connections in higher education. He's been doing some work in Australia in that. And I just said, this brother needs to be doing that work here with us at UCA. So I was so happy that he was able to um, oblige us and come. And Glenn is a, a really a, just a wonderful guy. He was so excited about doing this that he, he has a, a really incredible travel schedule. I don't know how he does it. He was giving me some tips on traveling as I was sitting there. But he was able to rearrange his schedule and be with us uh, tonight. So I'm really excited about that. So just a couple more things about Glenn's work. Um, he has hosted and produced educational programs for television and has written numerous articles on the topics of equity, institutional racism, leadership, and staff development. He is the author of Courageous Conversations About Race, a field guide for, for achieving racial equity in schools, which earned the Book of the Year recognition from both the National Staff Development Council and the Forward Magazine in 2006. And if you haven't gotten it, you should get it, the newly released More Courageous Conversations About Race. And I have to tell you, I am really excited about this volume. Uh, it actually speaks to some of the work that we're doing. You know, many of you have used the work of uh, uh, Peter Singe, so he has some work in there on the Assumptions Ladder. He's used something on Hyper's uh, Model for Change. Um, he's, he has some of Lee Monwa's uh, work mixed in there on mindfulness. So it's a really great book, and I encourage you to go out and get it. So let me rush on to the end, because I know you're about ready to hear Glenn. Uh, Singleton is internationally rec a, a, an internationally recognized keynote speaker who's consulted with a variety of uh, organizations on school reform and, and also with educational consortia. In May 2009, Singleton was selected to serve on the California State Board of Education's African American Advisory Committee, where he participated in shaping policy that promoted equitable education for the state's lowest performing students. Singleton currently resides in San Francisco, California, and he's also founder of the Foundation for a College Education, FCE, and currently serves on the FCE Advisory Board. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Glenn Singleton. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Good evening. 
Oh, yeah, that's all y'all got? Y'all, y'all going to dance on this floor with that kind of good evening? This is, uh, this is probably my most um, uh, challenging situation because uh, I know what exists between dinner and your dancing and drinks. And uh, that's me. And so uh, I want to uh, make this as um, uh, insightful, engaging, interesting as possible, and uh, also make sure that I do my best to have you walk away uh, with something to think about. Uh, So as Mark said, um, I am about to leave uh, to go down and work in Australia. And um, I thought that it was sort of fitting that that my book ends, because most of my work is now K-12, even though my study and most of my uh, professional experience is higher education. Um, But I kind of left higher education because uh, it was moving too slowly. And um, and I feel uh, some inauthenticity because uh, higher education is where my heart is. Um, I'm the first in my family to go to college, and um, everybody who has come up since uh, has gone to college and will go to college because um, I don't think we have an option around this, and and particularly. Uh, for people of color, and uh, specifically African-American people in the United States, uh, we need this higher education. And so how we get it right um, is, is quite important to me. It's almost purposeful uh, for me. And so I left higher education in my work because um, I just saw that I could make an impact in K-12 and perhaps uh, give higher education a little bit more Um, incentive and urgency. That is to say that if students are coming uh, into the university with um, the kinds of of teaching and the kinds of uh, K-12 experiences that I see of our educators across the country and our partner districts, I know that they will serve as a force to help higher education move forward as well. And so um, that's what I'm banking on. Now, off to Australia because of a very aggressive uh, process in higher education um, of the last couple of decades, particularly. And so um, some very specific statements about challenging uh, racism. Uh, Racism ends with me is one of the uh, statements of uh, the University of Melbourne. And so um, I'm going to be visiting with several campuses and then doing a keynote for uh, the national conference in two weeks. And so uh, I'm hopeful also that in partnering uh, Australia with the United States higher education system, we can learn some things. Um, Now, their K-12 isn't doing anything. And so uh, that's going to be a fascinating uh, connection as well. So I titled this tonight, Have You Noticed? And um, what I like to do with these uh, keynotes, this is the last, latest keynote I've ever done. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, it's like, it's disorienting. I mean, keynote's like in the morning or something, you know? Not over chicken. Um, <laughs> so uh, so um, what I'm thinking about is uh, my experience in higher education and what might be Um, a way of getting at um, what has taken so long, okay? And and so here is this place that is about the production of knowledge, okay? And it's also about producing the people who inspire people to learn, okay? And this is the the teacher education piece. And, And so when you think about it, there's probably not a more important room Okay, to, to really get at it. And so um, I, was, I was in conflict because I really want to get at it with y'all, okay? But I don't know you, right? And I also know that when I get at it with people who don't know me, they get upset. And so then I have this quandary of do I get at it and risk you getting upset, but at least I got at it, or do I not get at it and have you not get what you need? Okay, there you go. All right. 
So that's what I was asking. So, so um, if you didn't just invite me to get at it, know that somebody next to you did. And if something comes up for you, then uh, you want to you wanna look to them. OK, so, so what I want to do is I want to usher in this conversation today. And um, I want to um, first start with already recognizing that you have the right theme. OK, you have the right theme. And this theme tells me that you, you, you know these challenges to be there for a long time. You know that you know, we're not reinventing it to, to call it uh, to our attention. And we know that we have to uh, merge this idea of theory and practice. Okay, So in some ways, getting at it for me tonight means that I've got to help my higher ed colleagues come out of their heads and into their hearts. Right? Right? And, and that's, not a, that's not an exercise that um, we're often rewarded for uh, in higher education. Okay? And so um, I, want to, I want to bring my best of K-12. Uh, I find a lot of heart. Sometimes in K-12, I find such passionate heart people that they forget that that's not enough. You know, you can't passion a kid into high achievement. You got to have some skills and some knowledge and some capacity with that, right? And so I know we got some skills and knowledge in the room. And I want to also make sure, though, that we're applying the right set of skills and knowledge when we start thinking about what this conversation could be. And so it's not going to be what I urge you to read also. It's going to be a different version, a more personal version of what I wrote in my first book. So um, I would say that, that this getting at it is um, a highly personal thing, first and foremost. And um, I want you to begin thinking about when it was for you the first time, the first time that you knew that race was an issue in the society in which you live. OK, and I want you to go there. I want you to go there. Because the quote that I'm putting up here is a quote that's so critical in my life. The first time I read this quote, and I think it was you know, 35 years ago, okay, I said, wow, he's got it. Okay, so imagine 35 years ago, I'm just barely a teenager. Okay, and I'm already knowing that this is the issue here. Okay, we've got this elephant, some folks call it that's just sitting there, and we're incapacitated. And it's been sitting there for a long time. And the elephant's just growing and growing and getting bigger. And so how do we have a confrontation with the elephant? Right? How do we do that? And how do we do that from a place of truth? And, I, and, and so Dr. King meant something to me just by virtue of this quote. Everything else he said, I was like, yeah, bring it on. I believe you, I believe you, I believe you, because he got here with this. And so what I'm saying then is that when you first look at where this all begins for you, that's when you start to actually tell yourself that you're going to engage with this. You're going to be a part of this. And so my first year, I'm born in 1964. Okay, so I'm in gestation while my mom is a freedom fighter. All right, so any of that science around, you know that, you know, if mom's drinking a whole bunch of wine, there's going to be an impact, right? When my mom wasn't drinking wine, she was sitting at the counter in Woolworths in Baltimore. Okay, so from the moment that I'm coming into the world in this form, I've already had some schooling. I've been socialized. Right? And there's nothing that I can do with myself to not engage folks in this issue, no matter how much I try. And I've tried in all of my schooling. I've tried in all of my employment. I've tried in all kinds of elevators. But it doesn't happen. So what I've discovered is that I need to spend time figuring out how to do this, how to explore truth with co compassion and dignity. OK, so it's not good enough that I just tell my truth, and then people are just out on the floor. You know, I've just, you know, sort of knocked everyone out. And it's like, you know, folks walk away and say, well, it's not my problem that you can't handle truth. Mm. You know, and walk away. I, I know that that doesn't work. And so there is something, I think, that's so critical when you have a deep and profound truth. And that is that you have a deeper 
and more profound, compassion. Because that truth is not going to amount to anything if no one can stick around and hear it. And so as you stroll through here, what you now see are you see the places that helped me to hone my compassion. And so starting in Baltimore City Schools and then going into the Independent School, then into the Ivy League, then into more of the Ivy League, and starting to think, well, how do I get people to talk? So it wasn't to me that folks just don't want to talk about race. It was that folks don't know how to talk about race. And so what if I tried to create a way for people to talk about race? Let's see. What if there were a protocol to talk about race? What would happen? And so that's what the first book was. And the first book is a publication of the seminar that Mark was explaining, Beyond Diversity. Named Beyond Diversity because with the years subsequent to that, or previous to that, all I was doing was these diversity trainings, as they're called, where if everybody didn't hug and sing Kumbaya at the end, the trainer was fired. But how can you really have that situation when as soon as you leave the room, all of the issues exist? And in fact, if you've done a great training, you've surfaced all the issues in the room, so people really aren't ready to hug. Right, and so there had to be a truth still. Now the compassion was that people were hugging, but there was a lack of truth and therefore a lack of result. And so as we move down, we get to this idea that these folks who are doing this hard work have to get to come together. And that's what the summit is. That's where Mark and I met. That's where Mark extended this invitation. And that's why I'm here. Now, when he said this, and he said it was a higher ed piece, I automatically started to think in my old higher ed way. I was like, oh, I don't know if I really want to do that now. You know, that's a slow process. And then I saw your program. And I saw your theme, and I've listened to the conversations that you're having. And I met with the, with the doctoral students in, in the fireside chat. And there's some students here who wanted to be in the conversation. And I'm looking at the diversity in the room, which I did not expect. And so with that, then, is the indication, absolutely, there's progress. We can do this. We can have this conversation. And so what I want to engage you with today is I want to give you four different points that I believe you can start with wherever you go, even on the dance floor tonight, okay? I would urge you not to have too much to drink if you're going to do this, okay? I typically walk away when I see too many beverages, okay? We'll put that to another time. But the basic idea here is that I'm introducing to you one part of what I call the protocol, and it's the compass. The compass is described in the light color, believe, act, think, and feel. But what I'm going to pull you through tonight is I'm going to pull you through these four areas. If you notice first, and then engage with what you notice, work to understand that, and then empathize with what you understand, I'm guaranteeing you that you're going to have a healthier, more effective conversation in race. Okay, just these four areas. And this is the start. Now, do you become, you know, so proficient that you can just do it anywhere with no practice, you know, anywhere you go? No, it takes practice. But this is a start for it, so let's go. All right, so in this idea of notice, okay, I want you to notice, racially speaking, what's happening here. Okay? And here is however you define it. It can be small here. It can be large here. Okay? But notice to me is also um, challenging the, the, the operating perspective in this country that we're not supposed to see race. That we are somehow colorblind. And this was always an astounding piece for me from the very beginning of schooling when I was no longer in an all-black school. As soon as I got to that all-white school, okay, I was more confronted with race than I had ever been in my life. Okay? And it was fascinating to me because I'm being confronted with race, but I'm also being told I don't see race. Right? So it goes down 
all the way in seventh grade to today, okay, where someone walks up to me and says, well, you know, Glenn, I don't see race. And this is a white person here. And I said, hmm. And do you say that to everybody? <laughs> and therein lies the solution to that first problem. Okay, because the clarity around it is no. Okay, but it was important to tell me that. And the next thing could have been, I don't see you as black. And I was like, well, why didn't you say you don't see me as Latino? Since you don't see me. Right? And in this engagement, and there may be some people in the room who had this conversation, not with me today, but with someone. Okay, I get it. I get it that what we're trying to say is, I'm not holding racial baggage. Okay? I don't see you being black as a bad thing. That's what's really supposed to be said there. But the very statement of I don't see race is saying that I do see the baggage, there's a problem here. Because why wouldn't I see something if I see it? And so when you start from a place of not noticing, you've already distorted everything about what's going on. And so the first thing that we do is we notice. And we notice everything. And what will happen is you will have a little experience where you notice so much that it makes you tired. You will see just how much race and racism exist in our society, and it will blow your mind. And we will get to a little exercise where you will say, basically, I can't not see it. I'm like, perfect. Now we can start. Because if you're not noticing, then you can't get conscious. So to say that I don't notice is to say that I'm not going to get conscious about something. And so basically, we start to notice. So let's just notice some things in our society. OK, this is a problem. Right? And as we stroll through, personal lives. Okay? So don't go to you know, sort of the abstract theoretical of their only four members, but personal lives. And imagine what it must be like for those four members. Okay? In the private sector, as of the spring of 2012, there were six black and six Latino CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies accounting for 2.4% of all Fortune 500 CEOs. To date, there are 13 African Americans ever held the position of CEO in a Fortune 500 company. Okay? So when you don't notice things like this, then we also don't get an energy or an urgency to change it. And so we're not, we're not in a corporation here. But you can now begin to extrapolate what are the numbers in your institution. Okay? Because as long as we're only thinking about Fortune 500 or thinking about the government, then we miss the opportunity to think about our own personal space. So healthcare is critical. And we're starting to wonder, you know? There's so much intensity around quit smoking and eat well and all kinds of things like that. And yes, the United States is greatly reduced in smoking. And we're on the trail around this obesity issue. But imagine if we could notice racism and we could actually address it, not in a pharmaceutical way, but in a real communication way. So once again, until we notice, we can't actually address. And so when I put this slide up for my K-12 educators, yeah, we can think about prisons and so forth, but we don't have to. We can think about special education in your school. We can think about who's on time out, who's been referred, right? And so every time I'm creating a notice, but I'm also personalizing, and then here in education. And this statistic for me is particularly troubling because not only 
do I notice, but I also notice the penalty as an African-American male of trying to address this in the system. And so the irony of being an African-American male who did not become the bottom of the system, but a system that doesn't want to award space for the African-American male to talk about how to move beyond this. And so that standing ovation for Mark is so symbolic for me in many ways. If this organization allows him to talk about his experience inside the academy, the organization, and what it would be like to bolster that number of African-American males who are necessary in the graduate schools of education, so that all teachers can be exposed to what might help support African-American males. I say the same thing with our Latino educators. I say the same thing with our American Indian educators. And so I began with that data, because we always need data, right? And in it, what I wanted to point out was that race matters, okay? And it seems like that's a basic idea, but if it were basic, then we would be addressing it. So for whatever reason, we create a lot of proxies for race. Many, 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 many people like to talk about poverty instead of race, as if they are interchangeable, and they're not. In fact, these are our poor kids right here. And as you can see, there's racial disparity among those poor kids. This is the data sample that began my work, so it was formed in 1998. It is the decade of the 90s, okay? There's the gap. There's the same gap with the highest income folks. All right, and so in saying that, we see that it's more than an economic thing. Absolutely, they don't respond or perform as high as these people. But what we didn't pay attention to was the fact that these higher income African American and Latino students are outperformed by these lower income white students. And with that, you start to see that there's a whole issue here to address. It's not about economic status. Now, every time I bring this piece, and I love this data because it's the clearest. The only exception to this data is that the groups weren't fleshed out enough. This was the college board at that point. So we called them up, and I write about this in the new book, and I said, you know, you need the rest of the groups here because people are tripping on that. You know, so they said, okay, we can do that. So 10 years later, we get more data, and we've added our Native American group. Okay, but we've also said, you know, 60,000 is not a lot of money, Glenn. You know, people get really prissy about data. You know, so I, I'm, I'm not into data. That's, that's not what I'm interested in. But I'm in a world that you have to have data. So, you know, my experience is not enough data. Okay, and my experience plus all of the other, you know, people of color in my life around the country, it's not enough data. We got to put it on a bar graph. Okay, so I find myself like on this habit trail of getting data all the time. So here we go. 60,000 wasn't enough because that's still poor, people were saying. Okay, so we went out to 200,000 on this new data. Okay? And you look at these African-American folks right here, and you can see that they are outperformed by white folks all the way down here below 20,000, below the poverty line. Now, this is a wake-up call to the families I was working with in Fulton County, Atlanta, okay? and the higher-income African-American groups that thought that, you know, hey, we've made it. We've got our degrees. We've got our money. You know, we've got some cars. We've got a nice house. But your kids aren't reading. And so that's where we got to this idea that it's really not about these numbers down here. It's really about these categories over here. And in the newest book, we even have more data. See, it gets more and more complicated. Now, don't you agree that this was easier? <laughs> don't you agree? I got in so much trouble. It's like, why is that bar yellow? Why is that bar black? Really? Really, is that where we're going to go here? We're going to try to have this conversation. That's where we're going to go. No, come on, let's not do that. All right? And let's not keep making us go to the, because you know what? When you don't do anything, the data gets worse. So now we're all the way out here to 200,000. And look, you know, just bring it right on over, same thing. Okay? But worse. 
because we have more kids of color and we have less of a desire and less of an understanding of what to do and the problem is running away. This is what silence does. So when I talk, talked about have you noticed, I notice also that we really like to forget stuff. After we've spent a long time noticing it, and this is the second trial of the century, as it was called. So it's fascinating to me that I consider myself to be still kind of young, you know? And it's fascinating that I've lived through two trials of two centuries. And so when I begin to personalize this, okay, it is the conversation of how a country can allow itself to rest knowing that this happens. And this is the second trial of the century. This time a little bit more interesting because it's a brown man killing a black man adjudicated by a white jury. And the black man that was killed seemed to be on trial for his own murder. An interrogation of his family and his friends. And at the end of the day, it's still clear, Trayvon Martin is not a criminal, but he's dead. And so why is that different than Emmett Till? Why do we need new data? when the old data told us and we never responded. And so the second then after we notice is to engage. And engage means how does what I'm noticing cause me to feel? Okay? And so pay attention to what just happened for you as I evoke Trayvon Martin again. Okay? In a space where we are trying not to have the conversation, for real. And we have to have that image and that, not, that dialogue in order to carry it forward. And so when we engage, okay, it would make sense then that when you notice these schools, that typically in an audience of higher education, it would be like, okay, well, listen to this guy. Add a couple of books. 10 years teaching, and it should be like, okay, let's, 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 let's go. And I've got brand new Teach for America teachers telling me, no, that's not how it is. And so I show this picture because all of that schooling began there. And then it goes to engaging around race because that schooling became this. And this is how I know. Not the schools, but because of this. I didn't learn this at the University of Pennsylvania or Stanford. In the classroom. I learned it by surviving those institutions. And so those students begin to disappear. Only me and Jimmy here, and we were always called each other's name. And so that was strange for me in school. I never got called someone else's name up here. <laughs> it's like there are only two of us. Come on. That's just disrespectful. And so I would say that, because that was my reality. I was like, okay, Miss Thomas had, you know, 40 kids in here. A couple of them didn't get to take the picture because they didn't wear what they were supposed to, so they were clowning, right? And, you know, a couple didn't show up, and, you know, she pushed someone out during the, you know, picture because they were acting up, you know? And so this is how we get a class of about 30. 
Okay, but everybody, Mrs. Thomas, who taught three generations of students in my family, you know, not three generations for real, but like my uncle and my cousins and all of them, you know, different times, they graduate different times. Mrs. Thomas went to our church, you know, she was always there, she was in the grocery store, you know, if you did something during the week, you had to tell your family, because if you didn't, she was going to tell, you know, then you get in double trouble. But Mrs. Thomas could remember everybody's name in here. But then I get to Park School, which is supposed to be the school that says, you know, teach you how to learn, and the teachers couldn't learn who was Jimmy and who was Glenn. And that offended me. And what's more offensive is this is still happening today. Right? And some kids don't trip when you don't know their names. Right? They think it's funny. But you've got to know the history to know that some of us take that quite personally. And so when we graduate, Jimmy's gone because, you know, they couldn't remember his name. And I'm the only one. And so this looks like my education, and it's missing a huge part. And so every day, I would have to think about these two different arenas of study. This is why I get this. Notice, engage. And so it wasn't easy going between the barbershop and park school. And I would get to the barbershop, and they would call me white. And I would get back to park school, and they would call me black. I was like, wait a second, that doesn't make sense either. I'm acting white out here, but when I get to the barbershop, you know? And so I had to make sense of all of this. Again, who's teaching this course in higher education? And this is what our students are dealing with when they go into the advanced placement course and they're the only ones in secondary. So many don't want to do that, so they're not prepared for higher education. And so right now I have a great teacher, and I'm watching him. And I don't put this up here to boast or to brag. I almost got arrested trying to meet the president. <laughs> but the real deal is, as I watch him negotiate, and I watch him carefully step around, and I watch the black community in the United States think that he's not black enough. And I watch a white community in the United States say, why won't he do this? And I know, because he went to Punahou School in, in, uh, in Hawaii, and I know from reading his book and the fact that most people in the United States didn't read his book because they wouldn't have voted for him if they read his book because he says his, the best book he ever read was the autobiography of Malcolm X. That ain't going to work. That's deeper than Jeremiah Wright. Y'all haven't heard from him recently, have you? <laughs> but in reality, the idea here is that so few of us in the academy actually have someone that can, can mentor us. We can get a lot of coaching, but it doesn't work the same way. And so to see someone have to go through it and to, to sort of pick and choose, this is the first time in my life, so I feel real blessed that this is the time that I live, the age of Obama. And so the courageous conversation just gives us these, this protocol in engaging. It helps us to think about through some agreements. If you could imagine there are four agreements, and one of them's on each of the walls when you dance tonight. That one says stay engaged. That one says speak your truth. This one says experience discomfort. That one says expect and accept non-closure. Okay. And that is then the walls holding us into the conversation. And these agreements are contrary to the way that we typically act in our society, where we find it okay to disengage from the conversation, where we find that politeness is put over truth. When we find that, you know, uh, if people get uncomfortable, we're to stop. They're tears. They're going to be tears. 
especially when we get to that part of having to feel. And so the compass is a way of helping us to navigate then, helping us to navigate the conversation. When you think about the Trayvon Martin experience and you look at these quadrants, you can find the place where you were. Okay? And I know that for many people who have Trayvons in their family or, like me, have this Trayvon image, it's hard for me not to be in the feeling quadrant. Okay? But I also know, and I write about this in the second book, that the feeling quadrant alone, by itself, deep out here all the time, can kill you. And so that is why I moved into critical race theory. And I understand a country that gets paralyzed in a conversation around critical race theory, but it's a, paral it's a paralysis because of a lack of understanding. It's very basic in its, in its idea. Racism has been a permanent fixture in the United States society, and we need to engage a counter-narrative to be able to understand how racism plays out. That's all critical race theory is. And so by using these theoretical tenets, it helps me to balance my emotion. And only through balancing my emotion can I get centered and engage with people in these very difficult spots. Okay, and so sometimes what I find in schools is that teachers are too excited about the actions they're taking and don't spend enough time qualifying the beliefs that they hold. And oftentimes the beliefs are disconnected from the actions. Many times a family comes into a parent-teacher conference and they're sitting on this side of the desk. And the educator is sitting on this side of the desk. The educator is talking about test scores and what parents need to do to support their kids. Whereas the parent is sitting over here wondering if you love my child. This disconnect causes a breakdown in the relationship. And that breakdown gets in the way of, uh, of uh, successfully educating the child. And so it's important for us to ask how have we been personally affected by this Trayvon Martin issue. And if we've allowed ourselves to just forget and move on. Because if that is the pattern for the crime and the trial of the century, Imagine the everyday experiences in our institutions that we're just letting pass by. And those everyday experiences that we let pass by then become the everyday challenges for the educators that you are educating. And therefore, the problems for our students in school. So first, we personalize. Second, we get broader uh, perspective. And thirdly, we come to understand how race is not about color, but race is about power. And until we're getting to that conversation of what does it mean to examine racial power in the institution, we're not getting at deinstitutionalizing racism. And so at the third level, then, it's understand. How do we understand? And that means what personal meaning does that which I am feeling offer? Okay, so, so what is going on for me, okay, as I search for understanding around how I'm feeling about Trayvon Martin? And I keep it concrete there because before we can change what's going on in our professional experience, we have to get at our personal experience. That's what the Courageous Conversation Protocol is suggesting to us. First, we have to talk about race, Second, then, we have to know what we're talking about when we talk about race. Third, we have to examine the beliefs that drive our behaviors, and then we'll determine our results. That's the singe piece. And then fourth, we have to be able to create a space where our disequilibrium is the norm, and this is the hyphens piece. And so in my classroom, I am trying to keep my students always in what we call the zone of productive disequilibrium. And that is above where their learning starts, because if their learning hasn't started, they're complacent, that's the society, but they have to be below where their tolerance is, because if they go above their tolerance, they're not much use. 
And so what does it mean to educate? It means to hold people in that space. How do we do that? How do we get practice in that? And so some questions that I ask around that, as I'm trying to understand, okay? Simple questions as I examine the institution. And so if you're examining your system, and you're asking about the black students or the brown students or the Appalachian students, whomever the students are, all right? Is it a safe and well-resourced place for them? Where our students are studying, is it safe and well-resourced? Next, are the educators who are working with our students really qualified? So often the most needy teachers are with the most needy students, and we expect a different result. Okay, and so how do we make sure that they're not only qualified, meaning that they're nationally board certified in this case, but they have the emotional and intellectual, uh, the emotional intelligence to be able to support our students, the cultural competence and proficiency to be able to support our students. And again, as I talk about this with K-12, I don't see a difference in higher ed. In fact, I see more of a need in higher ed because of the duality. We've got students who are in study, and we've got students who are going to go out and actually impact the lives of the next generation of students in the schools of education. Okay, and so where does the curriculum feature our students? Fascinating enough, in my graduate experience, last week was the first time I went back to Stanford. I was invited back uh, to, to uh, have a conversation with uh, the education students and you know I had to say I have I didn't read any of the stuff that's provocative for me now I had to read it outside of school and so where was all of the work by Asa Hilliard and Wade Nobles and Sonia Nieto and Christine Dar uh, uh, Christine Sleeter and Antonia Darda where was Anton Troyer where are these people in the curriculum And are we expected to move forward? Are there high expectations? And then finally, the love, dignity, and respect. And I think that that's the key piece. That's the part that uh, is hard to translate. It's hard to uh, offer a very specific of what does that look like. Uh, without talking to people and having us engage from a first person place of what does it look like for a school, for a university setting, to be a place that, that is filled with and, and offering love, that's in, inspiring, that, that we feel dignified, that we feel respected. And so the last piece then is to empathize, and that's our feeling then, okay? And so it's really about being able to get in the place of feeling of the other. And so after I've given time for my own feeling, wherever I am, I have to create space for how the other person feels. Okay. And so much of my conversation, so much of my work in K-12 is with white females. And so, you know, my life is radically different than the life of a white female. Okay, I mean, I can't think of anything more different. <laughs> and yet, I still remain hopeful because I see and understand what gets in the way of white females understanding their students. And so I have to go into my teaching from the perspective of meeting them where they are. And if I can't do that, it's not going to work. Now, fascinating enough, the hardest thing to teach white females is to meet black males where they are. And I can't use the excuse that because she's a white female, I can't figure you out, so sorry. So why is that allowed for adults in school who are being paid? And so I love this piece, and this is what I close out with in terms of empathizing. And that is this piece that was written, uh, just, you know, social media goes crazy, and that's a very interesting thing in and of itself, you know. That's part of the urgency, uh, because uh, if we don't do it in the institution, uh, they'll do it online for us. 
Okay, and so we've got to really catch up. But this piece, uh, written in, in quite empathy to George Zimmerman, as he supposedly was um, uh, set free. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating quandary. Um, you know, he has a freedom that's not a freedom. You know, and, and I can think about this in the other trial of the century, a polarized United States where 90 plus percent of African American people found O.J. Simpson to be innocent. And 90 percent of white Americans found him to be guilty. And then we go out and work in the same workplaces the next day and act like that's not happening. You know, we can't just continue to allow these things in the United States to just be unsettled. We really have to uh, get our leadership strength up and start engaging and understanding and working through this. And so I'm looking at this guy, George Zimmerman, and for real, if he didn't know what Trayvon Martin's life was all about the day that he killed him, he knows what it's about now. And I got to think that when a 17-year-old boy loses his life this way in the United States and this time, we're all supposed to learn something from it. And we're all supposed to be mobilized around it. And I think that Trayvon is a calling for us to understand, to get into this space that seems so hard for so many people. Sometimes my students would say, you know, I don't know any black people, Glenn. And I'm like, well, get to know some. Why is that so hard? I know a lot of black people. We're fun. You know? I'm going to pause for you to fill that space with whatever your strategy is. Because ultimately, it's not about a keynote, it's about courage. And it's about your decision, no matter how simple it is a short 50-minute presentation here, or 300 pages in a book. But the real deal is we know how adequately we are prepared, or not at this point. And each of you are making a decision as to whether anything changes. How amazing it would be if this organization responsible for teachers decided that race mattered. And not only that, but you determined what a racial equity lens looked like, and you applied it to your policies, practices, programs, hiring. Next year, this would be a different conference. And that's in your reach. And so I leave with this uh, amazing quote by Maya Angelou. She says, courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. I named it Courageous Conversations because it's not just race talk. It's the courage to talk about that which we know will transform everything we used to know. It won't be easy, but I guarantee it would be worth it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.